fine. He does not say, yes, I want the happy little bunny to download, and then says, yes, Microsoft, I'm an idiot, and I want that unsigned app. Yes, I want to install that active control. He does not do any of that. All he does is he clicks on a link and he reads a website. Sounds, sounds good, right? Maybe he's even running Firefox. He's not running Internet Explorer. Or he's running Safari. Any Mac addicts here? Got one here, yeah. Safari, yeah, Safari's actually worse for this than Firefox. <gasps> Hate to break your bubble, sorry. Mac's perfect, Mac's perfect, don't sue me, Apple. Um, maybe he's running Safari and he clicks it. Uh, and he gets bored and he leaves the site, and then a couple weeks later he gets his monthly statement and there's $5,000 missing. Now this is a true story, an absolutely true story, it happened. Um, both the victim and the attacker worked for us, and this was a penetration test of a stockbroker website. Um, and this is actually, there are multiple financial and service institutions that have this vuln. But it really happens, and I know for a fact that it happens to real people as well. What happened while he was doing that? I'm just going to go for the graphic. Well, so he made a get request to cybervillains.com. Cybervillains a bunch of HTML and JavaScript. And it rendered. And he's reading his story up here, and he doesn't notice, because he shouldn't see it, that there's script running on that page, and there's a bunch of hidden iframes. Interesting. And these iframes are populated with form fields that match up the form fields of what you'd normally want to do on stockbroker.com. And what the script does, and oh, remember, he's reading his, he's got his, his ticker, right? The ticker's running in a different Internet Explorer window in JavaScript. It's got a cookie, but that cookie is between all IE windows. Anybody ever notice that, how cookies work across all windows? They use a shared memory section, a memory map file to do that. Firefox is the same with files on the hard drive. All the browsers do that, right? Um, it's got a cookie automatically. And what that script does is it submits these hidden iframes, which are pointed at stockbroker.com. It submits them in order, and the browser says, oh, I'm going to be helpful and attach this cookie to those requests. And what those post requests do in order is change his email notification settings, um, add a new bank account, transfer $5,000 into that new bank account, delete the bank account, and then change his email notification settings. So while he's reading this, he gets two emails saying, your email has changed, your email has changed. And that's all he sees. And this takes about 8, 10 seconds, depending on how fast his web connection is. So what happened here is this, app, this web, this application, this script, pretended to be him. And this is not a browser bug. This is totally legal. Site applications are allowed to do cross-domain posts from iframes with cookies attached. Anybody know what, what this is used for legitimately? Anybody ever here use SiteMinder or any of the single sign-on applications? This is how single sign-on works off in between domains, is that you do a cross-domain post from a hidden iframe with, a, with a, like a SAML assertion or some kind of encrypted cookie, and then the response sets a, a cookie for the other site, right? This is how you can get from bankofamerica.com to paymybills.com without having to re-log in. Makes sense, right? So this is how it's supposed to work. Um, what is the moral of the story? Well, the first moral of the story is there's no such thing as a browser security model. There is no such thing. There's no book called the browser security model. There's no RFC called the browser security model. What there is, is there's security decisions made by people sitting in Netscape in 1996 when they implemented some of these features, and those individual engineers who said something like, hey, I want to create this thing called an iframe, right? And I've talked to Tim Berners-Lee about it, and he thinks he's really excited, right? Um, and I, I don't care about anything else because I have a zillion dollars in my bank account. Um, that person who, who decided how iframes are going to work made some security decisions and wrote them into Netscape 4.05, and we have to live with those security decisions forever. There is no browser security model, and that's a bad thing. Nobody's thinking about this stuff. Uh, lots of people are thinking about this independently, and it's always people that like features, not security. And so that's one of the problems. The other problem is a stockbroker site used form posts, which are, are pretty easy to, to falsify. Gets are even easier. Those forms with easily guessed information, there's nothing not guessable in those forms. Um, and they didn't have anything random or encrypted. It's a very, very common issue. Uh, lots of people have it. Um, how about an AJAX site? In AJAX, it's both better and worse. If upstream communication requires XML HTTP request, it's better. Because for the most part, XML HTTP request only allows you to talk to what your document.main is set to, and you can't randomly set your document.domain to something else, right? You can only make it go up. So if I'm coming from www.webmail.com, set my document.domain to webmail.com. It's the same rules of who can access cookies. So that's smart. XML HTTP request does not do cross-domain stuff. But if your site does gets or posts, which can be falsified either with image tags or script tags um, or with uh, iframes doing posts, then you're just as vulnerable. And there's one situation in which you're way, way more vulnerable. And that's if you're doing the upstream request and downstream um, JavaScript. And actually, some web developers know about this. 
they know about it, and what this paragraph basically says is this is a great way of doing cross-domain AJAX, but don't tell anybody because we don't want the security people to take it away. Um, it turns out web, browse, web developers don't think much about security people. Uh, so, but anyway, you are allowed in your site to say, I want to get my script for my website from somewhere else. When you make that request, cookies are sent. Uh-oh. What can that mean? Well, it used to not mean anything, right? Because like I said, the script was supposed to be static. It was not supposed to have anything secret in it. But what if the JavaScript does have something important? So, like we have our webmail.com still. These poor guys are getting beat up pretty hard today. Um, and they have you know, upstream get requests and downstream JavaScript, and the JavaScript has the information that you want in it. In this situation, it's calling a function called add message, which takes a bunch of uh, information that comes from the email, calls into a function already defined within webmail.com's JavaScript, and adds the message. Make sense, everybody? OK, so that's how it's supposed to work. What if an attacker, if, what if you come to cybervillains.com, and I say script.source webmail.com slash inbox functions get inbox? That script now goes to a script tag on my cybervillains.com website. Now, I'm not supposed to be able to look at the source of that script again. OK, well, that's good. But what I can do is I can define a function called add message, because I'm a targeted webmail.com, and I have a webmail.com account, so I know this exists. I create a function as the bad guy called add message. And that function, instead of updating the person's uh, page with all of their email messages, takes all the arguments and sends them to my server. And so I'm now able to read this guy's email across domains when he comes to my site. That's a problem, obviously. It's, it's bad for JSON uh, arrays and raw arrays as well. Jeremiah Grossman figured out that you can override the array constructor. So you can override the array constructor, and then JSON that comes down, instead of creating a real array, you just take all that data and send it to the bad guy. In this situation, if you use AJAX like this, you're way worse for XSRF. Um, so the lessons are, if your requests are guessable, that's bad. You should add cryptographic tokens to your requests. If the requests are formatted simple gets or simple posts, that's bad. You want your request to be something that can only be formatted by XML HTTP request. Um, if the get request return valid JavaScript to one of those gets or posts, you're really bad because the cryptographic token thing doesn't actually work. If somebody can find one request that doesn't require a token, they can response and then perhaps pull the token out of that, right? And if requests are formatted as HTML forms, uh, you're in trouble. Um, and this is something that might get a lot worse, because developers want XML HTTP requests to work cross-domain for things like housingmaps.com, which talks to Google and talks to Craigslist. They want to be able to do that all from the JavaScript instead of doing it through the server. And so they want a mechanism for XML HTTP requests to work cross-domain. Now, I'll do this real fast, but there is a mechanism. Flash does this already. Flash has a file called cross-xml. And in that, the, the webmaster can define these are the places that are allowed to talk to me using uh, Flash. XML HTTP request. And those, thing, those requests are authenticated with cookies. So that's not a big deal, right? Because the, user, the, the webmaster has control, obviously. The webmaster can control whether they have XRF or not. But the, the point is, if you, if you put this into crossdomain.xml, allow access from all the domains, this is basically the web equivalent of putting plus plus in host.equip. Anybody remember that SunOS bug, like SunOS 4 or something? They put plus plus in host.equiv because it makes it easier to deploy sunboxes and then administrator them, right? It's, it's really easy if everybody on the network's at root, right? Well, that's the same statement here. But fortunately, the users have control, and this is well documented. So nobody would do this, right? Well, I'm going to take a little something from Johnny I hack stuff and do some Google hacking, and I'm going to search for something, and I'm going to find, it turns out, a bunch of cross-domain.xml's that have this, including perhaps one URL that shouldn't have this in it people that might need to know better because they've invented this and they own the application. I'm not going to say any names, Eric Lee, um, but that's a problem. OK, so we only have a couple minutes left. So Zane is now going to go through the frameworks reasonably quickly. And we'll talk about what the security uh, issues exist in the off-shelf stuff. Right. So we took a quick look at the AJAX frameworks, a few of the common ones out there. And we didn't do like an in-depth security bake-off between them or anything, but we wanted to see what features, if any, they give to like a normal web developer who's going to just grab this and start, start uh, applying it. So the first one that we looked at is DWR. Uh, DWR you use if you've got an existing Java web app. And what you do is you download DWR, and you let it know what methods you want to expose. And then it will create the JavaScript for that. It'll push it down to your clients. And then they contact the, uh, the DWR 
to our servlet, which acts as a proxy, and it pushes the calls onto your existing Java web app. Um, like Alex had said, what's that? Oh, sorry about that. Um, so because it's a proxy-based framework, uh, all your methods are gonna come down in the JavaScript because they have to be exposed to the client. So method discovery in DWR is incredibly simple. Um, if you want to, when you connect to the web app, uh, you'll see traffic like that just come down in a JavaScript file. Take a look at it and see all the methods that are coming down. Or DWR has a nice little feature where if you just append slash DWR after the web app, you'll see something like this, which is all the methods and all the classes for the web app. This is quite handy. Um, Cross-site scripting in DWR, uh, traffic comes down, it's just JavaScript traffic downstream, uh, placed in the DOM. There's no built-in filtering with DWR for cross-site scripting. Um, the sample apps that they show you that you can you know, download and set up to run, there's cross-site scripting all over the place. Um, you find it, you trip over it. Um, as far as XSRF, uh, looked like they might have some built-in protections at first. When you're playing with the demo apps, you see a field called uh, call ID there. Uh, turns out that has nothing to do with cross-site request forgery. Um, all right, I'm gonna speed through this then since we're pretty much out of time. Uh, that has nothing to do with, if you can play with that, it, it offers no protection whatsoever. Um, DWR is, you're gonna need to implement your own protections for anything you do with DWR. Uh, Sajax, since we're out of time, we're gonna skip. Think DWR, but you can't append slash, slay, slash Sajax, unfortunately. But with everything else, it's the same. Uh, Atlas, Atlas is not a proxy-based one. Uh, you download it, you add it into Visual Studio, and then when you go to create a new web app, you use the Atlas web template. Uh, framework. So method discovery in it, uh, while it is easy to do, you're not going to get all of the methods when you initially connect to the web app. Uh, whenever you go to a page, whatever functionality that page offers, you'll see the methods come down. They're very easy to sniff. You, you know, just take a look at them like that traffic. Um, cross-site scripting, there is a little bit of built-in cross-site scripting protection because it's with the .NET framework. Uh, it's not comprehensive by any means, but it offers a little bit, so you should definitely take care of it, you know, definitely use it. Um, cross-site request for uh, because it does upstream posts with XML HTTP requests, uh, those you can't forge, but if your web app uses Atlas and you're using upstream gits, you're still gonna be vulnerable to XSRF. Uh, you're gonna need to implement your own protections for that. Uh, however, it's not really a security feature, but because Atlas's serialization looks so weird on the wire, it's much harder to do an XSRF attack, but that's just because it's more obfuscated. Uh, Google Web Toolkit, also for an existing Java web app, but it's not a product situation. Um, you run Google Web Toolkit on your existing Java web app, it compiles it into JavaScript, which then you can just push down from static web server. Um, method discovery in it is hideous, um, several hundred K of that. Uh, it comes down to .cache.html file. Um, it's hideous compared to all the other ones. Uh, cross-site cross scripting, um, similar to cross-site request forgery with Atlas, uh, the traffic is really it's, the serialization is just ugly, which makes attacks much harder to do. Um, we played around with it, and cross-site scripting is certainly possible, but it, the bar is definitely raised. Okay, we're out of time, so I'm just going to do conclusions real quick and kick, kick it back to Alex. Uh, conclusions, only Atlas is gonna offer a little bit of protection. You should use whatever's there. Um, and with all of these, you're definitely gonna need to understand how the traffic looks on the wire and implement your own protections for them. They're not gonna, they're not gonna be a silver bullet for you. So let me kick it back to Alex. Okay, sorry about that, Sam.